Hi, everybody. My name is E. David Crawford, and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. Benign prosthetic hyperplasia, BPH, has been a real challenge in urology for a number of years. Joining me to discuss a study which was just published in the September issue of the Journal of Urology is a good friend, Steve Kaplan. Steve is director of the Men's Wellness Program, Mount Sinai Health System, and professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I guess <laughs> over the years, Steve, you and I have been involved in a lot of BPH trials. I can think of like two NIH trials, uh, the VA trial, and several other things that we have done lots of things to the prostate, injections, freezing, heat, lasers, Botox, alcohol, balloons, whatever, lifts, uh, steam, and uh, your report, uh, the Pinnacle study, I think, is a home run. Congratulations. And so can you share this with our GRU audience? Welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to see you. You were one of my uh, mentors as I was growing up in urology and looked to you as uh, for leadership. So thank you very much. Uh, it's kind of interesting how we kind of reinvent the wheel, so to speak, because early on in, in my career, we were doing balloons and prostatic stents, and they kind of fell out of the wayside. And ironically, now they're back. Uh, obviously, it's 25 years later, so they've been kind of remodulated. Uh, but uh, this ain't this ain't the same as we say think your grandpa's balloon. Uh, <laughs> in the in, in the 90s, when we did balloon dilation, it was a single balloon that just dilated uh, the prostatic urethra. The problem was it's, it didn't stay in place. It slipped a lot. So it was hard to keep it in place. And also the balloon uh, textures were a little bit different. So when the CEO of the company uh, that uh, makes the Optalum balloon called me about six years ago, a good friend, Dave Perry, he says, hey, I got this idea with the balloon and Paclitaxel. And I said, you're nuts. What are you talking about? This stuff doesn't work. So he goes, no, it's a different size balloon. And it uses two balloons to anchor and Paclitaxel. And, you know, I'd like you to be the PI. So fast forward, that's kind of what happened here. And we learned a lot. So I was fortunate to get in very early on the process and kind of learn a lot about the balloon and how to uh, you know, create the right sizing. But long and short of it is, I think the reason why this is different is twofold. One is it creates an anterior commissurotomy, which we never did with the old balloon. So it really splits open the top of the prostate. And ironically, and you know, classic urology teaching is when we used to do simple prostatectomies, that's the first thing we would do. We'd put our finger and crack the anterior commissure and open it up. So in a sense, that's what's happening here. And the paclitaxel, we believe, although I think we're going to be doing studies to prove it, maybe has an anti-inflammatory response. And it keeps the, if you will, the V as we split it open and it creates almost a V as opposed to a dilated circle uh, intact. And the pinnacle study was the, um, the regulatory study, the phase three study. The phase two study to kind of demonstrate that this actually works was something called the Everest study. And we now have four-year data on that as well. But in the pinnacle study, we had a uh, balloon dilation versus sham. And uh, we found that the improvement in symptoms at a year was statistically significant and kind of similar to what we've seen with Resume and Eurolift. But what was different, uh, I mean, dramatically different is the improvement in flow rate. We've never really seen this type of improvement in flow rate. It's almost equal to what we see with a TURP, green light laser, aquablation. It's surgical-like. And uh, you, you know, we thought, well, maybe this is one study, but we've actually now in our Everest study, we now have four-year data demonstrating that the improvement in flow rate is about 10 milliliters per second is durable and it's real. And I think that's why the retreatment rate has been so low. Retreatment, we've only retreated one patient so far in all the, uh, between the Everest and the Pinnacle study. So again, we'll see what it looks like in the community, but I think the game change potentially is the objective improvement we've seen, which we've never seen before in a minimally invasive device. Uh, that, that is absolutely amazing. That, that, that you know, that's a prominent table right in the beginning of your presentation. Yeah. Um, and you talked about the the impregnation with the uh, paclitaxel. So you don't think that has anything? And we paclitaxel is a chemotherapeutic drug, as you well know. It, it, does that have anything to do? with any anti-proliferative effects or you just think it's anti-inflammatory or do we know? Well, I, I, I can't tell you we know precisely, but anti-proliferative, anti anti-inflammatory, 
I think may all be the same phenomenon. You know, it doesn't seem to be any effect on semen because it's not that long a exposure as mm-hmm. opposed to some of the other, st- you know, balloons or stents because it's packed with taxol coated stents that stay in. So this is just like five minutes of, uh, with less than five minutes of exposure to the pack with tax. And we really haven't seen anything. It doesn't affect uh, semen quality. Uh, we had to do that as part of obviously the, the regulatory pathway. Um, but we'll see. I think it's an interesting study to do to find out what happens histologically in that tissue. But at least visually uh, and ultrasonographically and on, on MRIs, you just see that the top of the prostate stays open. Oh. And I think that's the difference. So, how, so this was a randomized phase three sham trial, correct? Uh, correct. How many men? How many men were in the trial? I, I don't remember the exact number because I've repeated so many different numbers. It was probably about a couple hundred. I think it was a two to one uh, ratio of treatment to sham. And something interesting about the sham that I'll point out, uh, because at three months the improvement in symptoms was terrific in both, but not statistically significant with either. And the reason we we found this is the first study that 100% of the sham treated patients thought they were treated. We've never seen that. So if you look at the resume data, the Eurolift data, it's about 50% of people who are and they're blinded to it think they're getting treated. In this case, 100% of the sham treated patients thought they were getting treated. So the sh- the sham arm was the catheter with dilatation or just inserting a catheter. <laughs> Just inserting the catheter, no dilatation. Okay. And, you know, there was a lot of, you know, there was a kind of a, an act that was put on, you know, there was certain verbal cues uh, that we wanted to make sure that was in both. But it worked because, what, as I said, we've never seen a 100% sham effect. And so it was well, kind of you cool, and I have done a, done a lot of BPH trials together. And the, these missed trials that we started a few years ago, the NIH trial, that yep. uh, never saw anything like this. So what... Uh, um, Tell us how this is done. Is it done uh, outpatient uh, with anesthesia and uh, how long does it take? So in this study, everybody got anesthesia um, and uh, not dissimilar to what we've seen in regulatory trials for for missed trials. Um, And it can be done as an outpatient. Patient goes home with a catheter. It varies uh, usually from anywhere from one to three days. I think it's going to be like an overnight catheter at the end of the day. And uh, like, if you actually look at the data with Resume, about 62% currently of Resume cases are done under general anesthesia. But Mm -hmm. can you do this under a prostate block? Absolutely. I mean, you remember when we did microwave, which is much more painful. Right. And and tuna, we did that under prostate block. Uh, In New York, we put them in a soundproof room so they could yell all they wanted. But, but, you know, (laughs) we we just gave them a prostate block and that was fine. So I think we'll be able to do that. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've seen a lot of trials in my career in BPH and different treatments. And I, other than TUR, I've never seen anything as uh, impressive as this. Congratulations. Uh, uh, I, I, there's going to be this optimum. I think there's going to be a run on this. We're not going to be able to keep up with uh, when when this gets out to the lay public. Uh, it's uh, Why would you want to do anything differently unless there's something going on we don't know about? So what do you see the future here um, with this, Steve? So uh, the company was is tentatively being acquired by Labory, uh, and Labory is now expanding their reach, if you will, to invasive, uh, minimally invasive urology. They have the stricture device uh, for using Optolum. They now have the BPH device. I think uh, they're negotiating with CMS to get codes and reimbursement. But assuming that it's similar reimbursement to ITIN and uh, and to Eurolift, I think this is a home run because uh, it'll be it'll be good for patients, it'll be good for urologists, and if the retreatment rate is as low as we think it's going to be, it's going to be a durable. So I think payers will like it as well. So at least on paper, the future looks very very good. Obviously, the proof will be in the pudding when it gets out to the real world. But so far, so good. We're pretty excited about it. Wow. Well, again, Steve, great to see you. Uh, congratulations. This is uh, a game changer. And we'll st- we'll stay in touch as this uh, moves along. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much.